Hello everyone, and welcome to the 124th episode of Analyzing Evil, featuring Stringer Bell from The Wire. Stringer Bell, and another more twisted character from The Wire, have been highly requested to be featured in an episode for a while now, and there's a good reason for that. Lauded as one of the greatest TV series ever made, The Wire masterfully presents us with multiple moral dilemmas that plague our society to this very day, and the complexity of its characters, and the struggles they go through, accurately portray the horrendous situations thousands, if not millions of people, have to endure on a daily basis. However, no good story is complete without good baddies, and that's where the subject of our video enters into play. Cool, confident, intelligent, and brutally efficient, Stringer Bell is part Machiavelli, part Sun Tzu, and part Frank Lucas, all adding up to one sinister character who will stop at nothing to achieve his goals. In this video, we'll be exploring all that we're given about Stringer in this series, delving into the many aspects of his character that enable him to be such an effective antagonist to all who surround him. Now without further ado, let's begin. Presumably born on the west side of Baltimore, Stringer Bell spent his youth running with his best friend and eventual boss, Avon Barksdale. When he was younger, Stringer was into the Black Pride movement, and he had aspirations to own two grocery stores and make his people proud through them. But by the time the story of The Wire begins, Stringer is second in command in the Barksdale organization, the dominant gang in the west side of Baltimore. We first spy Stringer in the opening scene of the first episode of the show, and at this moment in time, you'd be forgiven for thinking Stringer was a lawyer or some sort of other city official. Clad in an expensive suit and stylish glasses, the clean cut and handsome image of Stringer Bell gives off an air of dignity and respect. This notion is called into question when we spy the doodle on his notepad, but only so far as it gives us a glimpse into the darker side of Stringer Bell. However, regardless of that dark side, which we'll get to later on, Stringer is a relatively dignified man who commands a heavy amount of respect. While he's sort of soft-spoken, his voice is still one of force, but Stringer is typically even measured and calm when he's engaging in conversation. And though he displays bursts of anger a few times throughout this series, it's rare for us to see him deviating from his even temper, and his anger is more often than not as cold as his day-to-day -day demeanor. As far as a personality goes beyond his emotions though, Stringer is honestly quite bereft of one. He tags along with Avon and the other members of his gang, whether that be on a business venture or to find pleasure. But despite being cut from the same cloth, Stringer's personality is largely dominated by one thing and one thing only, business. Stringer's stern demeanor only serves to amplify this aspect of his character, as more often than not, especially when compared to his compatriots, he comes off as a no-nonsense businessman who would rather be counting money than watching a basketball game. This is heavily reflected in the way that Stringer dresses. Sure, he wears tracksuits, sweatsuits, and t-shirts every now and then, but as time goes on, we find Stringer dressed almost exclusively in business formal or casual wear. Unlike, say, Avon, who we find wearing a suit maybe once or twice, and the way a person dresses themselves definitely contributes to the image they want to project. And one look at Stringer in a suit or a nice sweater is more than enough for most to view him as a professional, not a gangster. What really sets him apart from the others, though, is Stringer's desire to be more than just a gangster. Avon, Weebay, Bird, and everyone else around Stringer are more than content to be gangsters and to continue to be gangsters. But Stringer is playing the game to win it. That is to say he's actively trying to better himself so he can stop playing it. We're given a deeper understanding of this notion in the second and third season of the show, as here, we see that Stringer is going to school for business, and his activities in the third season are mostly centered around his efforts to enter into the real estate business. This idea is further compounded by the glimpse we're given into Stringer's apartment at the end of season three. Tastefully decorated, pristine, and refined, his apartment belies the image that the majority of people have of him, showing us instead a well-read man with books like The Wealth of Nations, the autobiography of Isaac Asimov, The Will, The Back of Beyond, Chain of Custody, and many more on his shelves. A man who has a taste for the arts and a desire for a higher standard of living, and not the higher standard that men like Avon might wish to achieve, but one that you might find a lawyer or a doctor striving for. Now the greatest reason why Stringer is like this is due to his innate intelligence. His fellow gangsters are intelligent to a certain degree, but Stringer, he's gifted, and these gifts are what allows him to see the bigger picture, to harbor a desire to rise out of the circumstances of his birth and advance himself into a better world. 
It's this intelligence that has Stringer outmaneuvering nearly everyone he encounters in this series, be that friend or foe. And with all this in mind, we have a better idea of what Stringer's motivations are and where his heart truly lies. Let's take the time now to examine some notable instances that were given of Stringer's intelligence shining through, and we'll do so by taking a look at some of the skills that he possesses. Now during the first season of the show, Stringer plays the part of the loyal lieutenant well, and though there are quite a few times where we see him acting businesslike here. At this point in the story, it's more about Stringer showing himself as the executioner of Avon Barksdale's murderous will, and his man on the street, who keeps their ship tight. The first indicator we're given of Stringer's proficiency in his illicit profession is when he tells D how to spot a snitch in his ranks. Stringer tells D to stop paying his people, and when the inevitable time comes when their pockets are too light to survive, the loyal ones will come asking him for deliverance but the rat who's eating the lawman's cheese will be happy, content, and just fine without Dee's money. In this moment, Stringer shows us his capabilities as a strategist, a teacher, and an effective leader, and this lesson is imparted upon his subordinate with a heavy-handed lightness, as though he knows Dee needs this lesson drilled into him. He acknowledges the fact that Dee has made an error out of ignorance, and he must be taught if he's ever to learn. Dee's status as a relative of Avon might have something to do with the relatively gentle way that Stringer coaches him, but I believe it's very much in character here for Stringer to act as a mentor rather than a disciplinarian. His identity as a mentor is expanded upon when Avon is in prison, as here we see Stringer holding pseudo classes for his underlings at the funeral home, teaching them about the current market they're in and take advantage of it the best they can, as well as other aspects of business, things that Stringer learned from his own teachers during his own classes a great example of a patient man who is willing to learn and willing to teach, a rarity in the world that he inhabits. Stringer's observational and analytical skills are brought to the forefront when he's attempting to circumvent wiretaps, as when he's speaking to Dee and his crew about this, he almost immediately discerns that it's the nearby payphones that are the culprits, and he orders them to be removed. And this attention to detail is what aids one of Stringer's greatest strengths, his strategic mind. Stringer reveals himself to be a prudent strategist many times throughout this series, like when he advises Avon to enter into a truce with Omar after he's robbed them several times, surmising that rather than continuing to fight a war against him, if they can make him think that he's safe, they can catch him when he inevitably reveals himself in public. Or, another example is when he makes the decision to share the towers with Prop Joe so he can benefit from his superior product, and he makes another brilliant play with Prop Joe when they turn Omar onto Brother Muzon a scheme that almost ensures their previous scheme is secured, despite opposition from Avon. But by far the most brilliant thing that Stringer Bell did in this series, in regard to strategy, was to form the New Day Co-op with the help of Prop Joe, an alliance between the biggest gangsters and drug dealers in the city that brought an unprecedented peace to the streets, a business-like agreement that merged the various gangs of Baltimore into one insidious corporation, which is reminiscent of the Italian-American Mafia's commission. That is, of course, until Avon and then Marlowe ruined it. But not all Stringer is can be relegated to the respectable, as there are a few talents Stringer has that are far more sinister. For one, Stringer is a master at intimidation. Using his size and larger-than-life persona to his advantage, Stringer is able to browbeat everyone who crosses him into submission through words and body language alone. Because he's taller than most, he's able to look down on anyone, both literally and proverbially. And when Stringer is trying to intimidate someone, he does something quite unique. He cranes his head down to near eye level, instilling fear into his target with his hard gaze. But because of his height, even when he's at eye level, he's still looking down on you, giving off a terrifying aura as every aspect of his person allows you no other option than to look down as he overcomes you. And because he's one of the most notorious gangsters in the city of Baltimore, there's little chance that anyone lesser in stature than he will ever try to step to him when he's decided to step to them. As I mentioned earlier, Stringer does get angry now and then, but it's momentary, and everyone who faces a small amount of anger from Stringer Bell knows that it isn't the lightning that's going to get them, but the words of a man who needs only to lift a finger to have a knife slipped into your back. Now his ability to intimidate is legendary, and it's part of what makes him so imposing, but by far the greatest talent that Stringer Bell has is his skill in manipulation. 
Sometimes it's subtle, or even mixed with good intentions, like when he gives advice to Avon in the first season on several occasions, as they are friends and partners, and Stringer is looking out for him. However, as time goes on, his use of the people around him like pieces on a chessboard becomes more apparent, and it all starts when he tells Avon that he needs to insulate himself after Omar's assassination attempt. He tells Avon that he needs to lay low and run everything through him from now on, and on the surface, this is a most prudent action to take. However, there are many advantages that Stringer gains by forcing Avon onto the sidelines. For one, with Stringer as the front man, he gains the respect and credibility that any leader does when personally leading troops. As time goes on, this allows Stringer to cultivate a sense of loyalty strictly to him and his subordinates, rather than to Avon, who they never see or hear. With Avon laid up at home waiting out the storm, Stringer is free to enact policies on a small scale that will, over time, influence the overall direction of the Barksdale organization, that intended direction being towards legitimate business. At the same time, as he sees success in his new endeavors, Avon is forced into pacification when Stringer places money right into his pocket without him ever having to lift a finger. And in this scenario, if this sort of pacification didn't work, and Avon caused an uproar as Stringer gradually gained power, by the time he does so, Stringer would be in such a position that he would hold nearly all the cards, and ridding himself of Avon would only be a matter of how and when. Now, Stringer attempts to manipulate Avon to varying degrees of success throughout this series, and though Stringer loses a great amount of the influence he had prior to Avon's imprisonment and during Avon's incarceration, he does indeed attempt to usurp Avon in the end, but we'll get to that in a moment. As for other examples of his manipulation, we're given plenty. One of the most famous and insidious examples is something that many gangsters do, but is worth talking about nonetheless his honeypotting of Bodhi to convince him to kill Wallace. All Stringer has to do in this situation is ask him if he's built for the game, if he has a gun, and if he's ready to put the work in. And there you go, Bodhi is ready to kill one of his closest friends. This is something that many criminal shows, films, and real-life testimonies touch on. The fact that sometimes the person who's going to be taking your life is your best friend, and this moment shows us just how that comes about. That is, with a powerful man ordering or enticing the younger generation to do their bidding. And this is a harrowing example of how those playing the criminal game nurture others into the seemingly never-ending cycle of gang life. Next, we have Stringer using his relationship with Avon to manipulate a woman that he's wronged on so many levels, Brianna. Brianna is manipulated into convincing Avon to accept the tower deal with Prop Joe while he's in jail, and this is after Stringer orders the murder of D'Angelo, cozying up to her and her brother as if nothing is wrong, using the both of them to advance his interests in the drug trade. With the help of Prop Joe, Stringer sets up the confrontation between Omar and Brother Muzon, an act that requires his strategic mind as well as his manipulation skills, and he accomplishes this task with great efficiency, nearly convincing Omar when of his most hated enemies to do Stringer's bidding. This would end up being one of his greatest mistakes, as we'll soon explore, but the strategy and manipulation behind it is definitely worth noting. Now, these are all good examples of Stringer's street smarts, talents, and overall intelligence, but we're given more harrowing examples of his brutality several times throughout this series, and the first instance we're given is when D tips him off to the location of Omar's lover, Brandon. Prior to this moment, Omar and his companions had robbed one of Avon's stash houses, and in his attempts to catch Omar, Avon put out a bounty on him, but he also instructed his men that if they found him, they should display him like a white man displays his buck after after he shoots him, that is to say, on the hood of his car. With this in mind, and three men accompanying him, Stringer oversaw the torture and murder of Brandon, leaving him sprawled out for everyone to see on the hood of a car, just as his boss instructed. Now, it would be in character for Stringer to have sat back and let his men carry out this deed. However, though Avon remarks to D that Bird and Weebay served as the muscle here, I don't think a gangster like Stringer, no matter how dignified he tries to be, could sit back in such a scenario for two reasons. One, Omar and Brandon messed with his business, and nobody messes with the business of a man whose entire persona is about business. And two, you can't be the leader of a gang of killers without being a killer yourself and there's no way Stringer would have sat back and said, I'm good, while his men tortured and killed Brandon, as that would have only made him look weak. 
Then of course, you have the most despicable order that Stringer Bell ever gave, aside from the torture of Brandon that is, the shooting of Wallace, a brutal elimination of even the smallest potential weakness in his outfit that shows how absolutely ruthless Stringer is when it comes to protecting himself and his interests, and not far behind this in terms of despicability is Dee's murder, which was ordered for much the same reasons as Wallace's was. There are more people that Stringer condemns alongside Avon, however all of those people were playing the game, and those murders are not excusable, but they are less egregious when you consider all who play the criminal game know the stakes, and sometimes you pay the ultimate price for your involvement in it. And of course, who knows how many others might have fallen to Stringer personally for the same reason. So with everything that we've discussed so far, all of who Stringer is and what he does, what is the why of Stringer Bell? Why does he act the way he acts and do what he does? It all goes back to business and the desire for a quiet, respectable life. Stringer desires power, wealth, respect, and all the other typical things that gangsters endeavor to achieve. And just like many gangsters, Stringer is doing everything he does for himself. It just so happens that he has a better than average plan to obtain these things than most gangsters do. One that doesn't involve his end being guaranteed to be untimely death or prison. All work and a small amount of play, that's Stringer Bell, and his ambition to make something better of himself, to rise out of the wretched world he was born into, almost ensured that he lived a happy and prosperous life that would be free of criminality and evil. And indeed, everything might have worked out for Stringer, however as they tend to do, his lies and his schemes caught up to him, but most of all, his desire to cleanse his dirty world by using an oily rag and his efforts to change those around him who had no desire to be changed heavily contributed to his downfall. Avon's release from jail, Brianna's investigation into D'Angelo's death, his torture of Brandon, his betrayal of Brother Muzon, and the real estate scam by Senator Davis and Andy Krawchick, open wounds that festered until they became infected beyond repair. And in the end, just like with Bodie and Wallace, it was his best friend who hammered the final nail into his coffin, a man who was his brother to the last, who ended up signing his death warrant just as Stringer sentenced him to prison. A strictly business affair. And at this end, what is there to say about Stringer Bell? He was a man born into a world of poverty and crime, like many others. One who followed the path of a gangster, just as many young men who inhabit these places do. Harboring an above average intelligence, a strong will, and a heavy amount of confidence, Stringer evolved over time, becoming a man who desired to rid himself of the circumstances of his birth. One who longed to live a life free from the strife and misery that were guaranteed by his actions and the actions of those around him. But when it came down to it, the downfall of Stringer Bell was his attempt to go straight by using the dirty, trying to wash the unwashable. Some criminal organizations have found great success in doing so, but for Stringer Bell, this would end up being his undoing. The founding of a commission type organization, the investment of dirty money into a clean business through a dirty broker, trying to turn those who have no interest in being turned, and most of all, manipulating others and playing a dirty game. All these things led to the downfall of Stringer Bell. If it hadn't been Avon, Omar, and Brother Muzon, it would have been Marlowe. If it wasn't Marlowe, it would have been Marlowe's replacement, because there will always be another Marlowe, just as Avon said. If it wasn't Marlowe's replacement, it would have been a nice view of some bars and a yard for the rest of his life. Stringer Bell was intelligent and organized, and he had the capability to make anything of himself. And his efforts to shed the dreaded world he inhabited for so long are admirable. And had he been born under different circumstances, had he not been raised in the projects of Baltimore, perhaps Stringer Bell may have made something wonderful of himself. But he wasn't. And in the end, his choices were his own. Choices that caused harm and misery to perhaps dozens, if not hundreds of individuals. And though he tried to claw himself up from the fathoms of the abyss, his foolhardy attempt at bringing handfuls of it with him to the surface ensured that his fate would be one of the evil he sowed reflected back upon himself. Thank you all for tuning in to this episode of Analyzing Evil, and I hope you've enjoyed. What are your thoughts on Stringer? Did I miss anything? Let me know down below, and leave a suggestion for a villain you'd like to see featured while you're at it. If you like this video, hit that thumbs up button, and make sure to subscribe if you haven't already. A big thank you to all of my subscribers, to my patrons, and to anyone who's decided to honor me with a super thank. And a most vile thank you to those whose names you're seeing on screen now.
join the channel's Discord server and Reddit to interact with myself and the community, and follow me on the social media platforms listed below to keep up with the channel. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll be seeing you soon.